and welcome everyone. Welcome Harry. Okay. Uh, Harry has his own channel. It is uh, cognitive personality type, right? Theory. Almost. So close. Oh, theory. Yeah, so oh, far so away. Close. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, he has a great channel. On his channel, he talks a lot more about actually developing your type. It's a lot more educational than my channel. So if you're wanting to really learn about typology and get really deep into it. His is definitely better for that. Mine's more commentary, I think, on our on our community as a whole. That tends yes, to be more it's like a community channel. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today we're gonna have a little conversation. We're gonna have this video on this channel. We're gonna have another video on his channel. And we're gonna talk about some things that we both have some strong opinions on. And hopefully you will have a good time watching our conversation. We're both intuitive dominance, but mm -hmm. we will definitely try Try to keep some more facts and real <laughs> applicable information into that conversation. And prevent ourselves from meandering into you know a thousand different streams. So. Yes, we'll see how that it can goes. happen a little, <laughs> a little too easy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that brings us very smoothly into our subject of today, which is the idea of type fluidity versus a more rigid system. Um, we obviously both have very strong feelings on this <laughs> subject, which for the most part align. Um, so what do we mean by fluid versus rigid system? I guess it's um, multifaceted, but I guess one facet would be the idea that just because you have a certain list of cognitive functions, if you like, which I don't necessarily agree with in the first place, the idea that we have a top-down list of functions, but moving on, it doesn't mean that you cannot access, for example, one function. It doesn't mean that a function can't be expressed in a certain way. And like, as a general kind of like concept, it doesn't mean that a sensor is not an intuitive, a thinking is not a feeler, a feeler is not a thinker, etc. And that's um, one of my biggest gripes with the current state of affairs at the moment is if like, people are all on these little islands and then these islands don't seem to have any kind of connection between them. It seems like if you're this thing, that means you can do this thing and very little else. But it just doesn't correspond with reality. Humans are very fluid creatures. The way our brains work is in a fluid manner. Yeah, brains have predispositions, but that doesn't mean the brain cannot naturally and fluidly and even easily tap into something which it is not naturally predisposed to tap into. So that's really my main perception of what it means to be fluid in respect, in respect to cognitive type, yeah. Right, I think that um, while you were saying that, I think it makes sense that people prefer a more rigid system, especially mm. when getting into it. Oh yeah. Um, because when it's rigid, there are clear defined rules, you know exactly where to place things. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I hear a lot of people say is that they don't like that MBTI doesn't have, um, it doesn't have evidence per se it's not <laughs> provable per se yeah. with a more rigid kind without the more rigidity it mm -hmm. can't be proven mm -hmm. um and for a lot of people that's really really important yeah. um how i feel is that it is proven for me in mm -hmm. my experience and although i don't have a more rigid idea of personality mm -hmm. i do see it every day in real life oh, and yeah. i do see people having issues between each other because mm -hmm. of their cognitive functions mm -hmm. kind of clashing with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and by having this understanding of type, mm -hmm. I feel like you can, I don't know, it just helps make more sense of the world. When you keep mm -hmm. it so rigid, there's going to be so many people that aren't fitting into the system mm -hmm. because they're not a stereotype. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> automatically reducing the credibility of the system exactly. because if you're seeking to form, you know, accrue evidence, you know, in favor of a system, then the system has to be able to account for a countless amount of variation. It can't divide everyone into 16 types in this neat fashion and then assign stereotypes based upon this and, you know, essentially discourage any kind of fluidity outside of that stereotype. It just, it doesn't work. Um, and people are different in the moment. Our functions work differently in response to what we're engaged with in the first place. You can't simply, you just simply can't say this person exists within this box and they're going to be within this box for the rest of their life. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. And that's a major factor influencing why the evidence is so lacking. Then there's factors like the instrument and the manner in which information is obtained and the fact that we just, we don't really neural map things yet in the first place. So it's all this kind of vague, 
like surveillance of how people are acting or this sort of like this equally vague kind of like response to like questions they're being asked, which they could t- totally misinterpret in the first place because especially like, you know, people with what I'd call extroverted intuitive authorities, INFPs, INTPs, they can quickly point out the fact that this question, like it completely depends on the context and they would actually have a lot of difficulty answering the question in a very exact and precise way because they generally stray away from overgeneralizations. So... Yeah, there's so many factors influencing why the evidence just doesn't work. And some of them because of a bad system, other ones because there aren't enough subtypes within the system. And then other ones are simply because the method of actually acquiring the evidence isn't particularly great either. So I don't right. think that's just going to change anytime soon, to be perfectly honest. Right. Yeah. And I think even more so on top of that is a, a huge gap in difference and understanding mm. of even what the cognitive functions are, even oh, yeah. with the rigid systems, mm-hmm. there are different definitions. So you take a system like socionics, which is very rigid, mm-hmm. and they have a very specific understanding of the cognitive functions, but those understandings mm-hmm. are very different than classic MBTI, mm-hmm. Myers and Briggs typology. Mm-hmm. And because socionics people they tend to be very uh very sure of what they know because they've really studied most people Mm. who study socionics are really getting into it because there's a lot to learn Mm. um (laughs) and then the people who study mbti they try to learn socionics socionics Mm. people tell them they're wrong they tell socionics people they're wrong and we can't even agree in our own community Mm. on a rigid system that Mm. works um And I think that's because there are truths in both Mm -hmm. of these rigid systems, Mm -hmm. except the rigidity fact. (laughs) I feel like if you take that away, Mm. these systems would be much more accurate um, Mm -hmm. and much more uh, helpful and useful. But um, something that I've really appreciated about your system and the videos that you've had coming out Mm -hmm. is that you do view it as more of a cyclical thing Mm -hmm. and more of a rotating and sometimes one's going to be more more present than the other but they work together and at all times you're going to be using multiple different functions that aren't necessarily part of this four cognitive Mm -hmm. function stack exactly um, Exactly. and they aren't prioritized based off your letter stacking, Mm. they're prioritized more based on you Mm. and how you're using them and the situation that you're in. And it's a much more situational system in general, I would say. Yeah. And yeah, it's like the concept of continuums, for example, like in essence, I posit there are two cognitive functions anyway. There's the perception function and then there is the objectification, the value assigning function. And then, you know, these two continuums have two polar sides and you can say one polar extreme is one function and the other polar extreme is the other function. Mm. So for example, perception, you can either perceive very precisely and very specifically, or you can perceive more abstractly. And then you can say, am I going to direct that lens internally? Am I going to direct it externally? So the polar ends of this continuum would be intuition Mm. and sensing. But then like, where do you draw the line? Do you say that like, there's five functions on each side of a continuum? Because, you know, low magnitude NI is very different to high magnitude NI, and it's the same for extrovert intuition, it's the same for extrovert sensing. Extrovert sensing with a really high magnitude can be incredibly intense, but veering more towards the intuitive side, it's actually quite soft, and it's very different, and it'll be the difference between one personality and another one. So it's like you can either assign things into like, and keep subdividing until, you know, ad infinitum, or you can say, well, actually, in essence, this is what it is. And these two continuums are distinct from one another. And then you can say, well, people are always fluidly rotating between one extreme and another one and very, very rarely will be inhabiting either polar end. So. Right. Mm. And I think that a lot of theories are trying to get at this, like Mm -hmm. um, the four sides of the mind specifically, Mm -hmm. they talk about how you switch between all of these polars. Mm -hmm. So they give you a type archetype and they say that you flip through these four archetypes. Um, And that's not altogether true, but it is getting closer to the truth, I think. Mm -hmm. Like I can see these two extremes in me. I can see Mm -hmm. where I'm more go with the flow, excitable. And then I can see where I'm more, you know, like when I'm angry and I'm Mm -hmm. scrubbing the crap out (laughs) of the bathtub and cleaning everything around me in a really stressed way. (laughs) Um, 
versus my normal mode, which I could care less about the mess. You should see my desk right now. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, the four corners of the mind it definitely works. In essence, it's definitely a step forward in many ways. Um, I think it's still um, it's still quite blocky. And I think like right. if we're going to subdivide, we can subdivide further than four corners. We can say eight corners, and like everyone has the potential to be like one of the sixteen types in any given moment as well. Right. And so like. I wouldn't necessarily say the four corners are like more common in some ways. Like I have more of a kind of a an ENTJ side, for example, function wise, than I do necessarily a ENFP side. Even though the ENFP would be like the unconscious in a John D right. model, for example. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think. Um, but as you say, it's definitely a step forward. I think overall, at least like trying to see and demonstrate the way in which people can alternate, the cognitive functions can alternate depending on a situation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I'm hearing right now is another objection that a lot of people have um, and a lot of another struggle that a lot of people have, mm. um, which is finding out what their type even is. Mm. Um, and they want to be able to label themselves and understand themselves better. Mm. And so what I what I imagine happening a lot, if somebody who wanted to understand themselves and understand their type mm -hmm. goes into your system they might be a little scared because mm. your system isn't going to probably give them like a very yeah. direct, mm. this is your type, this is who you are yeah. kind of answer. Yeah. Um, and that's what <laughs> a lot of people, I think, they they come to MBTI mm. in the beginning for. I think people mm. stay for the development, but mm. they initially come mm. for the self-understanding. I, I think and that's what a lot I've of seen. The, uh, a lot of the clients I get as well in my type service, they on. Um, I'd say at least half of them really do need some kind of anchor. They really do need some sort of like, well, just give me this code. Let me, like, give me a starting point. Without the starting point, I'm lost. And, like, it's something I have to factor in. Um, I can't always mm -hmm. just be like, well, it, you know, it depends on this circumstance and that one. I always have to emphasize the fact that, yeah, functions are fluid. Um, if you want to go into your CPT score with the T2, then, yeah, okay, we can look more precisely into, like, in which ways you were fluid. But... I still have to sort of say, well, your general predisposition is this. And I think mm. that's generally enough to give people that kind of starting point. I don't think I need to say, this means this, this means you do this career, this means you feel in this way, this means you think right. in that way. But it does mean, well, generally, most of the time, you're going to be spending your time thinking in this way in response to your everyday circumstances. And this is where mm. it might alternate a bit. And then we can maybe explore the path forward in order to access more functions from there, for example. But yeah, like you do need to, in any given system, no matter how fluid it is, fluid it is, give people some kind of sediment to work with. Because otherwise, right. yeah, because like, even like for myself, I recall what it was like being me when I first got into this. I still need some kind of, some binary classifications because without these extremes, I couldn't start filling in all the gaps and the gray areas in between. So I think like being mindful of what it's like no matter like how naturally apt you might be at perceiving people in this framework manner, just remembering what it's like to come into this from a, the position of a blank slate, come into it without any prior knowledge of cognitive functions and maybe even no real analysis of the ways people's minds work, your own kind of anecdotal accumulation. Mm. Yeah, it's important to just remember what that's like, essentially. And then you can sort right. of say, well, okay, I can present some binaries to you. They're not going to be 100% factual because I don't believe in binaries, but at least with a grain of salt, you can use this to start right. filling in the gray areas yourself. So, so yeah. what I wanted to kind of lead it into um, is this idea of fluidity and mm. of what I'm kind of interpreting as like a spectrum. Mm. You're going to be along a spectrum in some, yeah. some way, and that spectrum placement is going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think like a really good analogy for this would be gay to straight spectrum. Oh, yeah. People want to put themselves at a very specific point, mm -hmm. but depending <laughs> on what person they see, yeah. they might not be attracted to them. Yeah. And then they'll be like, okay, well, that's a girl, and I thought I was more gay than <laughs> I am. Okay, so maybe I'm yeah. more in the middle. Yeah. And then, like, it's exactly the same, I think, with typology. And yeah. I, I think there's a Definitely. lot of stuff like that huh. surfacing right now, these spectrum yeah. Ideas like the autism spectrum as well. Mm, that's yeah. something that's becoming more common, yeah. and people want to place it mm. on a point, but you can't really because autistic people can mm. develop and mm -hmm. get themselves into a more neurotypical mm. uh, social, er like a 
arena. That's not the right word, but you know what I'm trying to I say. Don't even know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that I think that we're ready to move in that direction with stuff like MBTI mm. because MBTI was super big, like in the 90s, 2000s, mm -hmm. yeah. like especially with big businesses, mm -hmm. they wanted to get people in a position that yeah. made sense with their skills. Yeah. And the MBTI really did work for that. It helped. If, if you get an ISTJ, they're probably going to do a little better in a mm -hmm. role like accounting mm -hmm. than somebody like an ESFP mm -hmm. who's going to be a little bit more take charge. They're mm -hmm. going to want to make changes. They're going to want to be mm -hmm. in the moment. They're going to mm -hmm. get really bored with that kind of job. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that way, it's very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're using this just for business, sure. Mm -hmm. Like you can keep to the binaries. It's probably a little bit easier that way. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get into real personal development and mm. interpersonal development, mm. I think it is more important to take away those binaries just a little bit uh -huh. and try to see it more in this fluid way. Like maybe, maybe I get into a mode where I'm using NI a lot mm. and it's, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing it, yeah. but because I've overstretched myself in that area mm -hmm. now, now I'm unable to keep myself on track to this like NI vision I have created yeah. um, because now I've restricted what I want, which is my extroverted intuition. And I want mm -hmm. to be able to do all this stuff, mm -hmm. but I do also want to stick through and get a goal accomplished. Absolutely. And so these two sides of me are kind of conflicted because yeah. I've gone too far in one direction yeah. or the other. And being able to label that and be like, this is what's going on with mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. is helpful to stop myself from going in as far as I used to when I was younger uh, okay. yeah. and these places where I used to just go all in uh -huh. completely blindly, completely and in depth and then get into a major swing of dis disinterest, upsetness, mm. di uh, depression a little bit uh, yes. yeah. because I've gone too far to something that's, you know, not, I don't know. So mm. I don't know how you look at it specifically, but I see it like mm. as a, I have a preference for any, mm -hmm. and I have an innate need to have this freedom. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's specific to my type or just specific to me, but I have mm -hmm. a need for the freedom. And I feel like I find that more in extroverted intuition than introverted intuition. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a need to be able to show people a finished product, mm -hmm. show people that I can mm -hmm. complete things, show myself that I can complete things mm -hmm. and you know, do something with these ideas that I have because otherwise they're just ideas and mm. there's no point to them. Mm. And I want them to have a point at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And that's the thing, like, um, and I tend to argue that the utilization of other functions or other orientations of the same function in your case, it's necessary in order to allow one, first of all, to use one's dominant function in a non-guilty kind of way. I can do this, I can have this freedom because I know that it's conducive to positive self-change or positive mm -hmm. change in my external world. And then you can also say the fact that, well, I can only really effectively, in my case, employ introverted intuition, my dominant function, when I'm doing so knowing that it's gonna have an effect. When I'm doing so knowing that these visions I'm creating are gonna you know, be put forth into the concrete world. They're gonna be communicated to people, heck, they're even gonna be constructed into frameworks, or even going to be constructed into diagrams when I'm exercising my, you know, hateful extroverted thinking. And it's all combined together. If you want to effectively utilize your dominant function and feel good doing so, you need to dip into its opposite. You need to dip into other functions. You need other functions to complement it. So, um, yeah, I think like to say that if I was going to be switched into extroverted intuition, extrovert thinking mode, like for a prolonged amount of time, even more time than I would be spending in my natural state of introverted intuition, introvert thinking, then fair enough, I'd, I'd probably just have a kind of relapse. I'd kind of just need to suddenly like withdraw into an even more prolonged state of introvert intuition because I'd just be tired. I would have overexerted myself. But then again, the extent, the amount of time, the duration that we can spend in any given unnatural cognitive state well that's something that has to be trained it's like trying to run a marathon when you've only ever gone to like you know for 20 minute jogs for the last year it's not going to happen even though you've been dipping exactly. into the jogging you know consistently it doesn't mean you've acquired the stamina necessary to run a marathon because you've never pushed yourself that far and you've never 
really sort of built up towards that kind of expenditure. So it's like, as you were saying before, Michelle, it's like, it's very much connected the spectrums that we perceive in life, whether it's exercise related, sexuality related, or kind of the function related, they tend to all mirror each other in many ways, don't they? So. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is, I mm. for me, it's just so fascinating. And I feel like that's really mm. where I want to delve into next with personality is the more understanding mm. myself, yeah. where I sit on these spectrums, where I have poor lungs. Oh, of course. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. where my lungs going are going to give out on me. Yeah. <laughs> and the jogging <laughs> analogy. <laughs> um, like, like, for example, I know mm. that I need to use introverted thinking. And I know that that's something that is mm -hmm. uncomfortable for me to do, but yeah. I still push myself to do it. And I put myself oh, around people cool. who use it yeah. naturally to kind of nice. give myself an anchor, yeah. someone to practice with, who's you know going to be understanding, especially if they know <laughs> type and they know mm -hmm. it's not my strength. Yeah. They can help me out a little bit, ask mm -hmm. me more pinpointed questions, and it really helps me to develop that. But take me out of that circumstance and take me with someone mm. who doesn't know what my type mm. is and doesn't know that I struggle with that. And then mm. they're asking me those questions. I'm a little bit more prepared, but I'm still in that point where mm. if they ask me the wrong question and I don't know how to get to that answer, I, I do mm. get a little bit stressed. And that's like one of the biggest things I personally want to work on the other things I feel like are not nearly yeah. as big of an issue for me as that introverted thing. And maybe that's right now. Maybe yeah, it's because yeah, that's maybe. my focus right now. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's such a frustration for me to have to deal yeah. with that and be in those situations and be uncomfortable. Um, and I think a lot of us get into yeah. type because we want to understand yeah, why absolutely. we're uncomfortable yeah. in certain situations, why certain people don't get along with us. Um, and I think a more fluid system mm. that says, yes, you can work on these things. Here are ways mm. that you can work on it. Here are people mm. that you can work with on it. I think that that's yeah. one of the greatest advantages Absolutely. to personality and the personality community. You have people who can understand, even if they are mm. using the more rigid system, if they're at least right about their main or mm. their easiest function, that can be really helpful to guiding your conversation and um, getting to practice and stretch definitely, those muscles, definitely. so to speak. Yeah, and then like a danger, I guess, of this, because while it can be absolutely amazing, obviously, is that once you receive your type, your code or what have you, and especially if it's served on a certain kind of platter, such as like, oh, this is your inferior function and there's no point trying to develop it, you can develop perhaps an even more negative mindset than you had in the first place because you'll get that initial kind of, you know, that euphoria of, oh, this is who I am, I feel so understood. Oh, this is why I've always sucked at this kind of thing. But then it comes with a sort of like an undesirable side plate of, oh, and there's nothing I can do about it. So, and I mean, that relinquishment of responsibility can actually be very freeing for people. It can like almost become addicted to that kind of like, no, I don't need to worry about that. And the fact is most things worthwhile in life, such as self-development, are stressful. You can't just be phobic of stress. And if you are phobic of stress, you're more likely perhaps to sort of say, oh, this is my inferior function, and then I'm going to directly like, well, I'm going to seek out those articles or those YouTubers who sort of like really accentuate any kind of inferiority of the functions I don't want to use. And yeah, so it's, it's like, you know, it's like everything's right. a trade-off and there's always going to be like a, a yin and yang or like two sides of a coin to any given situation. And I guess this is the other side, the dark side of the coin here whereby you can get a lot of people identifying with their weaknesses and forgetting to take the message in the way it's intended, which is a message of freedom. It's a message of you know, self-growth. It's not a message right. of, here's a little hole, and you can dwell in that hole with everyone else in that hole, and then you can just pat each other on the back and say, it's not your fault, you're an INFJ, for example. So it, <laughs> that's not reality. That's, um, that's constructed, that's artificial. And that doesn't hold up in real life. If you put yourself outside your comfort zone, you're gonna find a way to overcome it. So that's my perception. I personally am one of those people that have used my type to excuse behaviors. Mm. And sometimes I still catch myself oh, doing too. that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, I didn't see that wall there. It's fine. I'm just bad at like <laughs> being aware of my surroundings. It's cool. Like, <laughs> that's just who I am. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I am a little awkward. Yeah, exactly. I, I run into walls. It's fine. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, I still have the bruises yeah, yeah. and, like, broken dishes and stuff that I have to clean up and deal with. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's really hard to say it's yeah. a good thing, isn't it? So it's like, oh, yeah, it's not my fault, but I, uh, it's annoying that I've caused a bad thing to happen. So it's like, hmm, can I really just run away from this forever or should I, you know, just enjoy the freedom of saying, well, okay, this is a bad thing. I've done that. I could probably do better next time. And even if it's a little bit better, well, I'm going to keep making improvements on that. And that's way, that way I can feel better about it because I think a lot of people are deluding themselves with this sort of say, you know, let's say like you or me, like special, special awareness in any given moment, too caught up in thoughts or too caught up in a pattern seeking kind of, you know, cognitive motion. Well, okay, this, we've incurred this bad thing. We've broken a plate, for example, in your instance. And what do you do? Well, you could just say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And then you can continue telling yourself that every time you break a plate and maybe even ignore the increasing amount of plates you tend to, you know, break from that point onward. But if you do that, the evidence from the outside world is going to continue stacking against you. The more you neglect your ability to overcome a function and the more you sort of just say, pat yourself on the shoulder and say, well, I can't do that function anyway. Well, the worse it's going to get. And then the harder and harder it becomes to delude yourself that there's nothing you can do about it. Because the fact that it keeps getting worse the more you neglect a function is actually, it indicates the fact that you are in control of the function. It indicates the fact that you can do something about it. And if it can continue spiraling down into this increasing inferiority, if you like, well, why can't it spiral upwards into, you know, something which can compete with its opposing function, and oftentimes your dominant function in this instance. So, yeah, that's how I perceive that analogy. Something that I was thinking about a little bit earlier, and I feel like brings back into this, um, you were talking about how people with a lower, lower energy, you didn't say energy, what did you okay. say? There's lower and higher of like N-I-S-I. Oh, magnitude. Magnitude. Yeah, yeah so people maybe um, with a lower magnitude versus a higher magnitude. In oh. your system, you talk mm -hmm. about how you can develop and become mm. a higher magnitude even yeah. if you start out at a lower magnitude yeah um and another thing that you say is that w with mbti or with cognitive personality theory we mm. want to be able to continue to develop ourselves mm. there will probably never be a point where we are perfect and even mm. and perfectly developed but that's kind of no the point of the system though, right? Yeah. To continue to develop exactly. yourself, catch yeah. yourself when you get down into these, mm -hmm. you know, where you're, you're completely neglecting one, like yeah. the dishes breaking, um, yeah. or you're completely obsessed with one overindulging in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's going to happen no matter how well, you know, personality theory, it's mm -hmm. going to happen no matter what, but mm -hmm. knowing personality, I think can help veer you back. Um, mm -hmm and get you back into that point where you're gonna get yourself more balanced and get yourself moving yeah. forward. Because yeah. anytime there is an unbalance, mm -hmm. the other neglected side is going to build up and it's gonna be harder yeah. and harder to deal with. So exactly. the fast, it's like depression. So mm -hmm. when I was in psychology, they described depression like this. It's like a dip and you go mm -hmm. down, you're in your lowest point, that's your depression. <clears throat> you get back up and you get back up to the neutral. Maybe you get a little higher, mm -hmm. but when you fall again, if you don't have some kind of plan or anything in place, sometimes you'll yeah. fall a little bit lower and it's mm -hmm. even harder to get out. Yeah. Um, and it's exactly the same yeah. with your, your functions. Mm -hmm. If you, if you try to go too far up, mm -hmm. you, you're probably going to start neglecting something and you're going to fall right back down exactly. and it's going to be harder to get up. So by using personality theory, you can help to balance yourself out mm -hmm. and make those waves smaller so that they're mm -hmm. easier to deal with and mm -hmm. they never become this overwhelming mountain or yeah. overwhelming ditch Absolutely. that you have to deal with. Exactly, because that's the thing, like the more you train your magnitude of any given dominant function, and again, I'll take an NISE axis, well, the more you're going to be increasing the magnitude of both sides of the continuum. The more my NI increases in magnitude, the more my SE increases in magnitude. But that means the more important it becomes to have that kind of axial fluidity, the ability to rotate on that axis. But in many ways, like the further away the function seems at the same time. So if you're a more neutral type, for example, the NI is fairly neutral, that means the SE is fairly soft and neutral at the same time. Well, there's less like distance. It feels like, oh, okay, I'm just switching between this axis. Or it may even feel like more of a dip between the external and internal. It's quite like baseline, if you like. Whereas like, if you do train a higher magnitude of NI, well, 
that distance seems greater. And that means you need to train your axis alongside it. Because if you don't train your axis, then that's the exact same thing. That's the exact mm -hmm. thing that will happen as a result. You just get trapped in this one side of a continuum and you don't feel like you have the strength to rotate and access extrovert sensing because the extrovert sensing is so high in magnitude that it just seems like an alien landscape and it seems frightening. So there's definitely like a downside to having that kind of like intensity, especially if your IQ introverted intuition is what I would argue in my case, naturally intense. The external world seems like a completely different atmosphere. And so it, it takes a kind of, you need to train a courage to be able to use your axis. And the further you develop your magnitude of any given function, the further you need to train your courage in order to then subsequently train the axial rotation. So. Right. And and we're talking about something that we both struggle with, which is yeah. this intuition and sensing uh, mm. uh, di the, the two sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. But there are people who maybe don't struggle with those as much, but do struggle mm. with the, what did you call them? The ju I call them judgers, but what did you call them? The judgment oh, functions, um, like feeling. Oh, the codec thinking. functions, yes. Right. Codex, lens and codex. So there are some people who more mm -hmm. so struggle with that side. Um, I definitely know a lot, like an ISFP, for example, using that mm -hmm. more generic code, but she's so very mm -hmm. much so in the feelings and that arena that when she gets to that yeah. extroverted thinking mode, it comes out exactly. way stronger yeah, than it would ever exactly. come out from me Yeah, because it's whiplashing back. Um, and so it, it does work for all types, even though we are more focused on what we're experiencing, because it's easier for us mm. to talk about our personal experience than to use other people as examples. Um, but it absolutely doesn't matter if, if we're talking about intuition and sensing or if we're talking about the, um, mm -hmm. the codec or the judgment functions, however you want to call them. Um, it's it, mm. you, you see that in your life. I'm sure you do. Um, if you don't, mm -hmm. Let us know. Tell me what your secret is. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that we've come to a really mm -hmm. good point in the conversation where we can mm -hmm. kind of conclude. And um, really the main point of this conversation is it is possible mm -hmm. to develop yourself. It is possible yeah. to balance yourself. And um, we both mm -hmm. believe that very strongly. And we're we're wary of systems that have very exactly. rigid structures to them because those structures mm. can be more mm -hmm. harmful than they are helpful. They can be helpful, absolutely, mm. especially in the beginning, especially when you're new. But if you really want to be the best that you can be and you really want to work on yourself and you really want to not deal with some mm. of the problems that you deal with now, whatever those problems are, I highly recommend that you look into this to consider even for a little bit the fact that your mm -hmm. functions may be more fluid than you think and mm -hmm. that inferior doesn't mean mm -hmm. that it will always be inferior and child doesn't mean that it will always yes, have exactly. a childlike disposition. <laughs> like these, mm -hmm. they can be helpful, especially in the beginning. You can yeah. see them, you can recognize them. But once you start working, it's going to be a lot mm -hmm. harder to recognize them like that. Um, and it'll be a lot better and a lot easier if you work on them mm -hmm. more in this spectrum mentality. But Harry, do you have any other last final words? Yeah, just, I'd just love to add, no matter whether or not you believe in this cognitive fluidity we're talking about, it's so important that you see this type code that you've been given, that you believe yourself to be, that you actually are in some cases as a series of gateways, as a key, if you like, to activating your psyche. Because no matter what functional model you use, there's still a level of activation of other functions. There's still an awareness that there's this kind of interconnectedness, that there are pathways of your mind. And you've just been told what these pathways are. And these pathways have doors that open and close. No matter what system you use, you also believe in the law of opposition. You also believe that as one function is used, its natural opposite is disengaged. Well, then by that logic, if you engage the other function or if you like disengage the current function, then you're going to rise that other function to the surface. So no matter what you believe, just really keep that analogy in mind. This code that you've been given is a key and you can use that key however you like. Yes, 
however you like, whatever works for you. That's really ultimately what's important. Sure, we have strong opinions about this, and I'm sure Harry would love to help you with his system. He's got a great system okay. going on. He has coaching programs that you can definitely sign up for if you're interested in that. Um, I don't have anything like that, but you can you can message me on Instagram if you want, but it won't be nearly as professional. <laughs> In all, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. Go ahead and like and subscribe. Harry's going to have a video on his channel, so go ahead and check that out. After you're done with this, it kind of flows nicely after this one. It does. Um, but overall, thank you guys so much, and I hope you have thank you. a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.